you know, we talk a lot about self-care, but we don't always practice it. And people notice that, right? But if you're talking about your goals, your purpose, what you're doing, what you're learning, that I think can be powerful and gives, sets the tone and gives people permission to back off and live more sustainably. All right, what's up everyone? And this is Anthony Kim, and I'm excited to share with you my conversation with Greg Carlson, the CEO of Leading Well. Leading Well is a new organization that's trying to build a community around wellness for educators. And it's incredibly important right now especially going through COVID and the pandemic and nine months of this. And so what I, I found is that some of the things that he's trying to help our educators with are just essential things that we need to put into our day-to-day -day routine. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right, what's up, Greg? Good seeing you today. And I'm really excited about this concept of educator well-being. I mean, I just love to just dig in here and just like hear what are you trying to do with this and what problem have you noticed that like motivated you to start this organization and what are kind of the core tenets that you're working off of well you know in terms of the problem that we're facing right you know the pandemic has exacerbated and highlighted multiple large scale challenges that educators are facing you know some are challenges that many Americans are facing, whether it's the virus itself, uh, economic difficulties, racism, these all compound difficulties for educators. And what's interesting is that our bodies evolved, right, to respond to stressors. People like to use the example of the lion, right, the lion that is chasing a human and we enter fight or flight mode. But if we are exposed to prolonged stress or trauma, it can be harder to signal to your, to your body that you have escaped. And so, so many educators right now are sort of they're stuck and frozen in the stressful state as the threat of that lion just keeps, keeps looming. And so one common reaction to, the, to chronic stress is burnout, which is characterized by exhaustion physically and mentally, by a sense of hopelessness, by a re reduced uh, capacity to empathize. And so burnout, you know, it's harming educators emotionally, physically, and cognitively, and it's hurting our effectiveness today and our health in the long term. And as educators leave roles, it hurts student learning and just perpetuates teacher and uh, principal shortages. And so this is playing out across the country, across the world. And we, uh, I've been thinking about solutions that exist both on the individual and systemic level. So one of the things that you mentioned, um, which I was thinking about is this burnout concept, because I don't know. I mean, when I think of like my work in some ways, like I'm working from home, I have the comfort of being at home. I don't have to fly around like I did, you know, working 16 hour days, traveling from one city to another every day. And that was stressful too. But what's the difference of this kind of stress? Cause that, I, I think there's a big difference into how, how people are feeling the uncertainty and the pandemic and social justice issues and politics and all of that stuff that's weighing on them differently. Yeah, so the uncertainty is definitely one piece. And the other, I think, is the fact that so much of our work is uh, physically confined to this very narrow box of space, right? Because, you know, at the individual level, the good news when we think about how to actively deal with stress is that there are decades of research that point, point to this, right? It's strong habits and sleep, nutrition, exercise, calming behaviors, a sense of purpose and a sense of community. But some of those things are now harder to access, right? Um, a sense of community can be harder to access when you have less access to physical humans around you. And even the act of exercising, right? We said that to sort of complete that stress cycle and escape from the lion that um, actually a lot of educators, if they were moving around the classroom, for example, would, their bodies would know that they were taking action in response to a stressful event. And that would complete the cycle and, uh, prevent people from getting that sort of like stuck in stress mode. Um, so that is another challenge that's specific to, uh, let's call it zoom school. And so the importance of doing all of these things is well documented, but also so many people just, you know, so many of us do not practice those habits sufficiently, right? And so giving information to folks is helpful, but I think the real challenge lives in implementation. And so my recommendation to everyone, including, including my clients, is to uncover your purpose, right? And ultimately ask what you want to bring to the world. And starting with that, reflecting at that depth can be uncomfortable, but exploring 
exploring the answer sort of paves the way to fulfillment and gives you that true north in terms of where you're trying to bring your life. And then how I think health can, then I ask folks how health can, can support their purpose, right? How can your body help you achieve what you want to achieve? Because aligning your, your approach to exercise, nutrition, sleep, and, and lifestyle to that physical purpose helps you stay motivated to, to sustain, uh, sustain those habits, right? And it can take trial and error for each individual and body, but uh, building lasting habits like that improves your health physically, emotionally, and cognitively, lets us move in alignment to our why, and just lets us be more effective today, um, less likely to leave our roles in the near future, and just be prepared to, you know, tackle equity issues in the long run. So, so I, I really never thought I would buy an Apple watch but I I did. And, um, you know, it has that little activity monitor, which tells you to stand and do all of this stuff, uh, walk, exercise activities, breathe even. And what I I find is I like just ignore it, right? Like it it tries to remind me, I'm like, oh no, I got the Zoom call I got to do. And so I get what you're saying. What tips do you have to like help people activate the actions that are necessary. Cause yeah, I, like having purpose, I think it's great and we all need that, but then how do I activate the things that I need to do in, at a routine level? One book that I've read that's really helpful on this topic is called Atomic Habits. Mm-hmm. Um, and it talks about the ways in which to sort of bring uh, habits to life. And so one principle in there is make it easy. Right. And so if part of your goal is around hydration, then literally, I actually, I did not plan this. I have a water bottle here because, uh, it reminds me that I should drink from this. Right. Yeah. And so that's one. Another is finding ways to make it enjoyable. And that's why I talked about sort of a personalized approach because, Some people really enjoy walking and that's a really, really strong way to sort of complete that stress cycle. Others enjoy having a right level sort of physical strength challenge. And, you know, sometimes working with a coach can help you identify what that might be for you. I totally get those things. I've read Atomic Habits. I've spoken to James Clear and I get that. But what I think is hard is, you know, we have a calendar, right? And we have six, seven, eight meetings back to back. And yeah, like, it's not hard for me to drink water, but I know that sometimes when I run out of water, I'm like two hours later, you know, maybe I'll make it back because I have all these back to backs. And how, how would you coach somebody to say, make five minutes of space? There are ways to sort of like make that plan. Sometimes have an accountability partner or find ways to hold yourself accountable can be really helpful. You said the calendar, for yourself is one way to do it. I also just think that, you know, we're not necessarily just trying to think about solving this for individuals, right? Let's think about how we can solve it on a system level. And so, for example, if we're trying to bring breathing and centering, then literally naming that strategy and introducing it into the culture of a particular organization, right? You could start each meeting with a mindfulness activity, for example or introducing brain breaks into meetings to let you physically move your body are other ways to sort of embed it systematically and build a culture of wellness. So the the last question I have for you really is, um, you know, if you having been a principal and having worked with networks of educators globally, as you kind of see what's going on in the world and with the pandemic and, you know, I think you probably would agree. A lot of people are just like working on fumes. Um, But I've been telling our folks that we're kind of at mile 15 of a marathon. And so what tips would you have or what recommendations would you have for my audience, which are, you know, school leaders and district leaders across the country? How can they create uh, kind of the environment, set the stage for an environment of well-being and self-care, uh, both physically and mentally, that will allow their teammates to kind of reflect, have purpose, and and set, be able to get through the second half of this marathon we're experiencing. Well, I do think, you know, I talked a lot about the power of, you know, individual practices. And I do think that um, when you're leading a system, 
I'm mindful of the role of modeling, right? We've long talked about superintendents and principals and teachers as lead learners. And I think that same concept applies here where, you know, we talk a lot about self-care, but we don't always practice it. And people notice that, right? But if you're talking about your goals, your purpose, what you're doing, what you're learning, that I think can be powerful and gives, sets the tone and gives people permission to back off and live more sustainably. We talked about that importance of purpose, right? But I think that anytime you're leading any, any type of change within a system, it's similar to that process for individuals. We're identifying that clarity of purpose, right? We talked about the need to help navigate uncertainty, but just sort of leading change through ambiguity mm -hmm. requires offering stability. And so having a lot of clarity where the organization is headed, right? And then from there, once that's in place, I do think it's really valuable to articulate a vision for wellness, right? And outcomes, right? Do Does your system have a vision for the health of your staff, your mm -hmm. students, your community? Mm -hmm. Thinking about this through mission and strategic plan and partnerships and graduate profile and other student outcomes, right? Like what would it, what would it look like if all of our graduates had the competency to define that purpose and then to uh, develop habits for themselves that help them move in alignment with that purpose? All right, cool. So, hey, Greg, thank you so much for, you know, meeting with me today. I think that anybody that's been listening to this, they should check out your website, leadingwell.global. I think that there's some really interesting resources and, you know, uh, I'm sure if they want to reach out to you and ask for some tips that you're, you'd be available to talk to them. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Anthony. It's an important issue. Happy to join you here today. All right. What do you think of that conversation with Greg? Greg offers some really good tips and some great coaching. And I think that some of the things that come up for wellness also come up for just great leadership. And that's modeling for others, providing stability, and just having a vision, whether it's a vision for wellness or a vision for your organization. Just having all of that as part of the way you approach wellness in your organization is essential. So peace.